Lord, we just thank you for this incredible deal, Lord. We're 50, I don't think we've ever had a fundraiser or anything like this with this amount of people. In the past, we never had 50 people doing the fireworks. But, Lord, it's just amazing what you've done and how you've brought people forth and how their hearts are willing and we all come together and, and the burden is light, as it says in Philippians. And we come and we thank you for that, for this. And Lord, what we know, there's a lot of work to be done. It'll get crazy out there. And Father God, we pray that it would get done. And Father, that we could be blessed and the food bank could be blessed. Already we, we up the, the, the um, budget in, in faith and that we will be receiving funding. And, and yesterday, that in one hour, there were 31 people coming for food. And they represent families. And so in the day before, same thing. And so, Father God, we just thank you for that. We also thank you for Victory Outreach, the, the church, Lord, that meets here and their, uh, women's, out, out, their, their women's outreach home. And, Father God, that they're going to be helping some. And, Lord, we're going, going to help them out financially some also to bless them. We thank you in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right. A lot's been going on this past week. Of course, a lot's going on every week. Um, and we have this, you know, I'm on live stream, and so you have to be careful. You, you don't want to miscommunicate. You don't want to say things that later on you can't take back. Uh, the nice thing about the audio messages on the website is we could always go and edit them. If I have some terrible grammatical mistake or if I misquote some Bible verse or, or I say John instead of Paul, we go back and fix that. But with live stream and YouTube, yeah, that doesn't happen. It's, once it's out there, it's out there. And so, Lord, I just pray for this message, Lord, that it would be just perfect. It would be balanced, and people would get it, Lord, because there's such a swing. We Christians tend to swing to the left and to the right, and we have a real hard time staying on center. And so, Lord, let it be on center this morning. In your name, Jesus, amen. Also, I seem to be getting something uh, passed around from one to another. The message this morning is reveal and heal, or reveal or heal, or Y2K. I can come up with a bunch of different titles for it. But first, I want to start with telling you a story. I haven't been telling enough stories because before when I would say, I'm going to tell you a story, Everyone would laugh, and, and they'd say, oh, no. Some people would say, oh, no. Others would laugh. But I'm going to tell you a story. This is a true life story that happened to me in the past three weeks. And this isn't, you know, this isn't Uncle Jeff's cousin's nephew John's story. This is firsthand experience. Now, what happened was I have a dental plan, and it was a great dental plan with an incredible dentist. And then we decided we were going to try to save some money, and we switched dental plans. And they both had the same name, the same company, Delta, but one's Delta and the other's Delta Care. And so I knew that my dentist took Delta, and I wasn't concerned about it because he's so great, he's wonderful, he's a Christian man, we're friends, and, and you know I, I just am really happy to be in his hands, or my teeth to be in his hands. And so what happens, I go... To, to go to the dentist to, to get my teeth cleaned. And he goes, we don't take Delta Care. We only take Delta. And uh, at the time, he should have said to me, well, there's probably some good reasons we don't, but, uh, or there are good reasons we don't. But anyway, I went to the Delta Care thing, and there were like a half a dozen people you could go to. You couldn't just go to anyone. I, could, I thought I could go to my dentist, but no, he, I'd be paying 100% if I went to him. And so... I go to the Delta Care and I find the, the you know the what's available and I go to look at a few. I go and I don't know about that place just from, from the outside, never mind. But I find one on the plan, and I go to the guy, and he takes X-rays, and he tells me you need four crowns, and you need other work. You need to have uh, fillings changed. You have a cracked filling, you ha and he shows me this filling here. He, uh, he says. It's fractured, the filling's fractured, you're going to end up needing a root canal if you don't get it fixed, and you need to do this pronto, especially one here, this is critical. And so, $4,000 bill. 
And so I say, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to think about this. Second opinion. So I go to the plan, and you have to drop the guy you first went to and sign up for the guy, the next guy, second opinion guy. And so I go, it's same plan, and I go, and the gal looks at it and everything and takes x-rays, messes up on the first x-ray, so she has to take them all over again. She accidentally deleted them, so I'm getting a lot of radiation. Which, I, of course, the first guy didn't put a cover on me, didn't put that lead cover on me. Yeah. And so I'm really getting radiation. But anyway, trying to make this short. So they look at it, and they have the, the, the x-rays up on this. It's like high tech and very impressive. You need six crowns and fillings swapped out, fixed. And so then I say, OK, well, how much? And she, they, she says, well, the insurance company pays zero. They pay nothing for these. You pay. And I said, well, how much is a crown? And the first guy had told me metal crowns for, for uh, the 4,000, and uh, but that could be like tin or stainless steel, um, not gold, not precious metals. Uh, and so she, she says, you, sh you need all porcelain. You, you don't want metal because any metal will make your gums recede because your gums are allergic to metal, so they're going to recede on you. And they only last three years. That's the warranty. And they almost, just like, a, just like a car, they almost always go out of warranty at the end of three years. And then you're going to be paying out of pocket again because the insurance won't even cover any of that. But they will cover something with metal, but metal you don't want. $1,000 for each porcelain one. And so then I say to myself, well, why should I go to these people? I'm just going back to my, at those prices, I'm going back to my good dentist and find out what he charges for a porcelain crown, because this is supposed to be, on the plan, discounted prices. So I go to Dr. McClure, and Dr. McClure tells me, you know what? It's $1,000. That's the price. That's not discounted. That's just what we charge. And I'll take care of you, too. And so I say, OK. And then he takes the x-rays, and he comes back. He says, you don't need one crown, not a single crown. Yeah, he says, you don't have a bad crown. You don't have a cavity under any of your crowns. And I, I don't, you know, someone can tell you preventive, which one of them had told me, and you can do that, but I won't do it because I don't remove good crowns and replace them. I only remove bound, bat, crowns that have cavities or whatever. And so I go, wow. And so long story short, I'm, you know, thankful. Now, it was, it's, I still need like the 800 bucks worth of work, but from... 4,000 to 6,000 to 800, hey, big difference, amen? And so his assistant's in with him, and they're just saying, you know, Ken, it's terrible. Dentists used to be like number one on respected professions. And he said, doctors are still up there, but we have really gone down. And it's because of this, these practices. And he said, you know what? It's embarrassing to us. When people come in for their second opinions and there's a list this long of what the dentist said they needed and we look at it and 90% they don't need. And it's just embarrassing to us. But then at the end, he said something very profound. He said, Ken, you know what? This isn't just dentists. He said, and I had mentioned car dealers and things like that, you know, like how they do those kind of things. Not all of them, but some. And and um, he said, that it's not only dentists, Ken. He said, this is one more reflection of the overall moral decay of the American society. And he said, a decay that's becoming so pervasive in more and more sectors that now we're really finding it across the board, no matter what you do. You go and they tell you that your car warranty is bumper to bumper, you, your car air conditioning breaks down, you go, oh no, not air conditioning, just drivetrain and trans just the transmission, the engine, and the rear end, and, and on and on and on. And he says it's a reflection of the malady that's invading our country. And this thing with the... Um, the teeth, the, the crowns, it's not, it, it's not an isolated tumor deal. It's not an isolated sickness. Or it's, it's a moral sickness that 
is just pervasive and growing. The whole banking, the whole mortgage thing that took place that almost ruined our economy, the greed, the loan brokers encouraging people to sign up for loans that they never should have been signing up for, the, um, the pornography uh, industry, which is just making zillions of dollars, uh, making 50 billion or something every year, uh, this Ashley Madison website where, where they're just, they have 38 million people paying to, to, to find someone else to commit adultery with. Only married people can be on it. And it goes on and on. The fornification, the, home, the, the, the heterosexual fornification and immorality. More couples now live together outside of marriage than ever before. And what's happening is that there's, I think it's turned already where there's more, the, the, there's a, the majority of couples living together are not married now. And this is a real turn. Homosexual fornication, abortion, lying politicians. It's becoming one gigantic cancer. The lack of ethics in our society, the dishonesty, Right, I sit on the board up in Yuba City uh, at the Calvary Chapel there. You know, Larry, can I get some more water, please? I'm sorry, I didn't bring enough up. Um, I sit on the board up there, and, and we rent to a, an entity, a, a, a school, a private school, and the guy has been telling us, the guy's been telling us that he's getting uh, a certain amount of money from the people that, that are his, thank you, his subleases, and it turns out he's getting double that amount. But he's telling us, oh, I'm only getting a, a, a couple thousand instead of 4,000, and so we share that, so you, so you guys only get 1,000 of it. Well, it turns out we come to find out one of the elders talked to the, to the renters, and they said, no, we've been paying 4,000 a month. On and on and on. And so what we have is we have a society that with drugs and with alcohol and with just all these different things, marijuana, all these things, it's gotten so crazy, so degenerate, so full of decay that now the cocaine and heroin cartels, they no longer count money. Guess how, it was, how they find out how much money they have? They weigh it in wheelbarrows. Counting's too slow. What they do is they, they know that if they have $4 million in currency, it weighs a certain amount of money. They stick it on a commercial scale, and they pull the wheelbarrow up on there, pla a, a plastic wheelbarrow, and they weigh it, and then they know we have 3800000 or very close, maybe give or take a $100 bill. That's how crazy it is. And so now we have this Supreme Court decision a few days ago ruling on the definition of marriage. Now, the Bible clearly states what marriage is. It's between a man and a woman, and that's, been, that's worked for millennium, literally millennium, and now in the last 15 years, we have nine people, and not all nine, but five of them declaring that the people's will, because 50,000 voters said no, but declaring that this is a constitutional right. Well, the weird part is that the Congress or never, the Constitution never defined marriage, and so how can it redefine marriage? And so we've got all this stuff happening. And we must remember, before, I'm, I'm going to tell you this before I even forget, I'm not going to take the chance of forgetting, never forget, Jesus told us to love the sinner and hate the sin. And don't mix the two up. Don't go after people, whether they be fornicators, a couple living together who aren't married. Don't go after people who are heterosexual or homosexually doing that and not love them and hate them. Wade mentioned that. Don't hate the people because that is wrong. We're to love everyone, not what they do. Not, we're not to love our own sin, but we are to love ourselves because the Lord says to love yourself. Now, not in a, a you know, prideful, hedonistic way, but just to know, hey, I'm a creation of God, I'm forgiven, 
I've repented, I'm, my sin is forgiven, even though I'll sin again today or tomorrow, but then it's forgiven again. And, you know, I, I need to, to have a good feeling, not just beat myself up all the time. Now, of course, if you're just sinning over and over again and using the grace card, that can be a big problem. And that's another whole matter. Now, on the social media, things are going nuts. You know, you've got both sides, and, and they're very passionate. There's those that are just, you know, celebrating, and there's those that are mourning. And those that are saying the world is coming to an end, that our country is coming to an end. Well, you know, I heard that with Y2K. It didn't happen. I heard that when, when at the last election, when the president got elected. Oh, this is the end of the world. Well, the world's still going on. Why? Because the world is the world, and the world's just doing what the world does. That's what they're doing, and they're doing a good job of it. Probably a better job than we do when you come to think of it. You know, we're kind of good. We're like some of these medical uh, profession, professionals. We're, they're not so good. Like we just, you know, poor Dennis, his son, uh, was, was diagnosed with Crohn's disease for a year and being treated for it, and it turns out he's got liver cancer. And so now they're, or we don't know, is it cancer or still waiting? Okay, it is cancer, we don't know, but for a year he's been treated for Crohn's, and he could have been being treated, but, and there, there are lots of people counseling, people are good at diagnosing, and sometimes they're not good at diagnosing, but the, it's the cure that's important, not the, you know, the diagnosis so much. And so, you know, you have to be careful, and, and you have to, you know, with this social media thing, you know, hating, you're, you know, you're, you're gonna go to hell burn in hell, I'll be, I'll be loving it when you're there, or whatever, that's not where it's at, no. And we've had these decisions, Roe versus Wade with the Supreme Court, giving all women the right to abortion. Well, horrible things, very, very in line with Bible prophecy and the apostasy in the last days. All this stuff is, you know, what the Bible says is supposed to happen and will happen, and it is happening. And we don't want to be a people where we, the, the sky is falling down. Is this good? No. Not in my opinion. I, don't think in, I think the Bible says it's not good. I, I know it does. I, is God angry? Well, I don't know. I know he, it's kind of hard to be angry when you already know beforehand what's going to happen. Usually when I'm angry, it's because I get caught off guard. In fact, I've had to sometimes apologize to some of you because I got angry with you and lost it, and I've had to go back and say, you know what, when you first told me that, it was just so, you know, dumb that that happened, and I got angry, but, you know, I apologize for my reaction. And, 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 the, and you know, it's all a balance. And, you know, already there's, we don't know what's going to happen. It's so crazy. It's so insane. The uh, homosexuals are having some big difficulties. A lot of them are losing their businesses. This is true. I was reading in the New York Times yesterday that got pe homosexuals who had nightclubs and bars, uh, who did ho homosexual cruises, and uh, on and on and on, the stuff that we've been seeing on TV the last year or so in almost all the programming. Well, guess what? The bars are closing because the culture is being destroyed. You see, there was this culture of living together when there, you were isol you know, you were, the, you were the victim. And so you gather together and you say, well, we're gonna make our own bar where we can go and we can drink freely with no, well, now what's happening is those same exact bars are full of heterosexuals because it, to everybody, it's just a bar now. They, Hollywood is saying that we can expect a lot less of the same gender marriage thing on TV than we've been seeing. Because now it, they don't need to put it on there because it's, it's a done deal. And so, you know, th they're gonna take that off. Different repercussions, it just, you know, it, it's like, who knows? The stuff is crazy. And then, of course, the, you know, the religious organizations, along with the polygamists and others, already have stuff in the court. The day of, they filed motions. You know, if love is love, well, why can't a polygamist have more? You know, they love each other, so 
You know, what's wrong with that? And, the, and the, of course, the church, with all of our lawyers, Pacific Justice Institute and Capital Commission and all, we have tons of lawyers. We're filing suits to, to, to up the religious protections that we have right now in law. And we're saying, well, now because of this, we, we want more. We want, it, we want many more guarantees. We want more laws passed protecting us. And so we're, we'll, you know, we'll get some more. And that's not a bad thing either, but it's just like, you know, God's plan and the last times, apostasy and all this, and it, it's the world. It's the way it is. Now, how do we deal with it? Now, Romans 3.23 tells us all have sinned, all lie, all steal, all lust, all drink. To, not all drink, but if you drink to drunkenness, it's, it's not good. We take the Lord, people take the Lord's name in vain. And unfortunately, it's not just the world doing these things. Unfortunately, statistically, the church is as, as guilty as the world. The amount of men, and this isn't secular polls, this is Barnuff, and, and this is um, a Christian ministry. Let's see, what's the name of those guys? Uh, I'll come to it. But polls have been taken, and just as many men watch, Christian men watch pornography as non-Christian men. It's equal. That's terrible. That's, that's you know, you want to get up and talk about something? You want to get up and get a, you know, a banner or a, a placard or whatever? Well, that's, that's terrible. That's why we have these software programs that you can't, you've got a partner and you can't go on the internet without the other person knowing what you're watching. Abortions. Many Christians are involved in abortions. And you would think we, we were beyond that, but unfortunately we're not. We have all these couples. Did you know that at one point it was against the law for two, a young couple to fornicate, to live in fornication? Did you know that? There were laws in states that you couldn't do that. You had to be married to live together. Well, you know what? Most people don't. Why? Because those laws were so long ago, and no one now, with the mindset of hooking up with you know s someone of the opposite sex, if you're young, is so prevalent that that they don't even know that that ever took place. But that did take place. All kinds of laws protecting the morals and and protecting society uh, that people don't even know about. Now we have churches, plural, many many churches out there where there's kids that grew up in those churches and they never heard anyone talk about homosexuality from the pulpit. They never talk, heard anyone talk about heterosexual fornication from the pulpit. They never heard anyone talk about uh, same-sex marriage from the pulpit. Never, because they avoid large churches, mega churches. And why? Because they, you know, didn't want to, they wanted to make it a megachurch, and if you start talking that stuff, you're not going to have a megachurch. And so they, but then what happens is you've got kids, like we have kids here, who they started yay high, but they heard it. And so, yeah, now they're adults, and they're out there with, with kids their age, or young people their age, 20 or whatever, because most of the 20, the majority of 20 years old kids and young people think this all, all this stuff is good. They think pornography is good. They think fornication is good. They, you know, I talk to people when I'm out there, and I, you know, I, you know at first it, it just shocked me because I would talk to guys about porn, pornography, and how it's, you know, it's not I, not not just sinful, but how it's destructive. And guess what? They looked at me like I was nuts, and they blatantly told me, "Are you kidding? Pornography's." Every guy needs some pornography in his life. And that's what they believe, because that's what they've learned. That's what they've been taught. That's what their friends do. And I try to throw some light on that. You know, no, it ruins marriages. It does all kinds of bad things. It ruins relationships. It has men, and now women are involved in it big time in pornography, but it, it makes it so people don't get the deep relationships that they once had because they're influenced by these things. And, you know, it's just terrible. But, okay, all right. 
or else they just say you're nuts. But what do we do as a church? Do we Matthew 18 people? If we know there's a couple here, a heterosexual couple that are living in sin, they're living together and they're not married, do we tell them they can't come to church here? Well, I already see people saying no. But, you know, if you read Matthew 18, Matthew 18 does talk about immorality and, and approaching people and, and you know, that the, you go with one witness and in and, and, and Corinthians and whatnot and, and you go with another and then you go with the church and, and if, if, if the person's in immorality, sexual sin, Christians, not non-Christians, but Christians, you don't break bread with them. You don't even eat a meal with them. That's in there in the New Testament. But then there's also in the New Testament, like in Peter, where if you're married to an unequally yoked woman, man or woman, and you don't divorce them, you're a Christian, you got married before you became a Christian, they're unequally yoked. Well, you don't say, oh, well, they're unequally yoked. I'm not going to, I'm divorcing them. No, you pour the Holy Spirit melt on them and you win them over. That's happened in this fellowship. We've prayed for people for years. There's at least a couple of guys. One guy's on the elder board now. But we prayed for him for a solid three years, never thinking he was going to get saved. And he got saved. Now he's an elder. And so you want to leave room. <coughs> and so to some extent, the Bible indicates that both are true. You know, yeah, there's need for discipline and there's need for love. And I think that it needs to be dealt with individually on you can't just lump them all together you need to talk to the person as their repentance you know if they're living together and they say hey we know this is wrong but we're not going to stop and then there's always oh but we're going to get married well we're going to get married isn't married i'm sorry but that's become something in our society that has become acceptable when a lot of christians are told and then also moral non-Christians who believe in marriage and believe that you shouldn't be having sex before marriage and all that, because it's not just Christians who believe this. There's non-Christians who believe the same thing. And they confront their kids or whatever, and, the, and they say, oh, but, okay, but we're going to get married. Well, now that's becoming where 50% of the people say, oh, oh, okay. Oh, you're going to get married? Oh, good then. All right. Well, you know, it's not the best. What you're doing really isn't the best, but you're going to get married after all. But how many don't? Many don't. And then you're setting yourself up for problems because you're defiling that sacred relationship that God has set up called marriage. And God says in, in the Word of God that the, the marriage bed is for a married man and a woman. It's not a bed that, you know, you can hop in and out of with one person or another, um, you know, and try it out. You know, this thing of, well, we want to try it out before we, before we marry each other to make sure that, that, you know, we're compatible or whatever. Well, that's not what the Bible says. And so what do we do? Do we start changing what the Bible says? Do we rewrite the Word of God? Well, that's been done, and, you know, we've already got some of that going on in different translations. You read different translations of the Bible, and they've already done some of that, removing gender. There's one translation where it doesn't say male or female, and not just for marriage, but for across the board pretty much, even for God. It says the person or, you know, they or whatever. Are we a knee-jerk? And we tend to be knee-jerkers in the church. We tend to get all worked up over stuff and, 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 you know, we don't really strategize or plan it out. And the other guys, they strategize and they plan that out and they won. You know, they got what they wanted. In the meantime, what happens with all this stuff is Satan loves it. I remember my first experience with it was abortion back in the 80s. There was the big anti-abortion movement and it came into our church. And half the people at that point, now it's changed a lot, but half the people were saying, oh, no, well, abortion's okay. The other half were saying, no, it's not. And it became this total battle in the church. And families got split. The church ended up splitting in two. And the other factor that happened 
was the focus. Because what happened was those that were, you know, it was new. It was all a new movement. There was the zeal. It's like how now the gays are losing their cultural relevance as far as culturally and because it's not new anymore and now it's done. Well, back then abortion was new. And so what happened was half the church wanted to focus on abortion as a ministry. And, you know, we weren't, they didn't want to be in the word so much or they wanted to be out there going after abortion clinics, doing all this, you know, and, and it became where the main thing was no longer the main thing in the church. It became where the main thing became abortion, that issue, that political, that moral issue. And we don't want that to happen either, do we? No, the main thing is the main thing. And who's the main thing? Jesus. Now, last week in chapter um, 8, then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, in John chapter 8, but have the light of life. And then in chapter 9, in verse 5, Jesus tells his disciples, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. None of this stuff is going to put the light out, put our light out, because we are the light. And you can't put Jesus' light out. And in fact, what we find is the more that you persecute it, the more that you try to, the brighter that light, history tells us, it grows. The per persecution in history was the best stuff that ever happened to the church. In the early church, when the persecution happened, that's when everybody scattered. And they went out to all kinds of places. Their Jerusalem, their Judea, their Samaria, and the far corners of the world. And they went out because they got scattered. But then they went out and they said everybody in the world started to get saved. And so the persecution can be a good thing. It's hard to say. I mean, the, you know, the American church is pretty soft. I personally think we need some persecution. Uh, you know, we have what people ca are calling persecution, which is, you know, it's like not. We're not persecuted religiously as Christians in this country. I mean, if you think you are, you know, I'll take you to Africa the next time we go. But Jesus is the light of the world. Now, for some, as disappointing and as, as disgusting as the court ruling was, it is unlikely the ruling in itself is going to sink this nation. What's going to sink this nation is the dentists. That ripple effect of the lack of integrity, the lack of ethics, the lack of honesty, the lack of morality that we're seeing across the board. And it's scary. Ivy League college students at Harvard and Yale were surveyed. And they were asked if it's OK to lie. And guess what? Over a third of them said yes. Not only okay to lie in school, but okay to lie when you get out of school. That's scary. That's Harvard. These people are going to go in, and they're going to be the movers and shakers of this country. And we have this general thing going on. And did God allow the Supreme Court ruling? Well, of course he did. Does he, does he allow the abortion laws? Well, of course he does until he changes it or until we get enough people get together and abortion has gone down since 2010. But it's all in God's hands. He's not surprised by any of this. He's in control. But Amos chapter, 11, eight, chapter 8, verse 11, this holds true throughout the ages. In Amos chapter 11, 8, verse 11, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God. Now you hear a lot about this. Behold, the days are coming. There's a lot of Christians out there that say, oh, you know, we're going to get judged. Obama, President Obama saying, oh, a lightning bolt came down on, on all these people who were trying to or, or prevent this, and, and this lightning bolt came down, and now there's justice. Well, we, you know, that, I think, was an abomination. I could have gone to the bathroom and gotten sick when, when I heard that. I really could have. I mean, if, you know how we, when your stomach is bad and you can, if you go, you can do it, but you can hold it in? Well, I held it in, didn't get sick. 
But here we have an Amos, behold, the days are coming. Now, a lot of Christians are out there saying, yeah, you know, oh man, wait, something's going to, big's going to happen. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, ISIS just, you know, killed 200 people or what, or, or killed, I forget, a couple dozen and, and maimed 200 in a, in a mosque recently. So all kinds of craziness is going on. Amos 8.11, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God. For what? What are they coming for? What's, what's coming? Okay, listen to this. That I will send a famine on the land. Sound good so far? Let's read the rest. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water. So not the kind of famine that we look for, that we think should happen, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. You see, that's the famine. That's what's important. When the word of God is no longer heard, when the word of God is no longer preached, when we don't share it, when we sit back and do nothing, when we hear somebody using God's name in vain, when we hear, about, when we hear a couple talking about, oh, uh, you know, oh, uh, this is my fiancé, oh, oh, great. Yeah, when are you getting married? Oh, we have a plan for a year from now. Oh, so, so where, where do you live? Oh, we live together. Well, what do you do when you hear that? Do you say it's bad? Do you say it's sin? Or you just move on? That's the question. As I've said so many times, the people in government don't worry me very much because they're going to be gone sooner or later. They get four years, the president gets four, maybe eight, and then he's gone. But it's the people who put him there. That's what worries me. And when we hear about, like, I'll, I'll tell you, my daughter, when she, she was married for a year or so, and then she decides to take off. Well, you may not like this. You may think this is harsh, but I disowned her. I said, you know, as long as you're doing that, I can't, you know, I'm not going to have a relationship with you. You're in sin. You're, you say you're, I said, are you a Christian? She said, yeah. I said, well, if you weren't a Christian, then it'd be different. But you're saying you're a Christian. And so don't call me, and I won't call you unless you, you know, decide you're going back with your husband. Well, guess what? She went back with her husband. And they have two beautiful kids. She did this before she had kids. Have two beautiful kids. They both are Christians. Wonderful family. No talk of divorce. No talk of going off. No talk of ad adultery. No thought of that. Now, some people said that was harsh. But that's what the Word of God said. It said you don't break bread with Christians who are who are in those situations, and it says it because what you do is you cast them out to Satan that the flesh might burn. And not so they turn into crispy critters and die or go to hell, but just that what I did, I turned the heat up, and her relationship with me was important to her. And so it pained her. It tore her up. Pastor Gene was... was constantly in contact with her at the time. And he said it just tore her up, and she couldn't take it, the loss of her father. And she re repented, and wonderful marriage, great marriage. Now, I'm not saying that's for everyone. I think you need to pray yourself, you know, because I don't like formulas. God, you can't formulize God. You can't say, oh, this worked for Pastor Ken, so I'm doing it, it'll work for me. Because you may lose your daughter or son forever and never, they'll never have a relationship with them again. That could happen too. And so, you know, you kind of, you have to pray about it. You have to pray about what God would have you do. Now, did I love her the whole time? Yeah. 
I didn't not love her. She's my child. So it wasn't a matter of not loving her, but it was a matter of not going to break bread with her. Hard stuff. Very hard stuff. What do we do? You see, what's happening in this great nation of our, ours is that the lights are turned off. And it's not just one, you know, we have this sin that's in the forefront this week. But then it's another sin next month. Because we've got uncontrolled sin going wild in this country. In all areas. Yuba City, the guy telling us he's getting $2,000 a month because it's a share of the split the rent, and meanwhile he's getting $4,000 a month. He's a Christian, supposedly. I mean, just, you know, all this stuff. Shacking up, porno, heterosexual, homosexual, fornication, abortion, redefinition of marriage. Christians are blind. The people out there are blind, but we're supposed to be the ones who reveal sin in our society, but then that we also bring the healing. And Jesus is cast out. That's the problem. Chapter 9, after de declaring himself the light and the life of the world, what does Jesus do? He commences to get step out of the temple. Why did he step out of the temple? Huh? This is last week. They threw rocks at him. They chased him out of the temple. They, they stoned him. Because they didn't like what he had to say. They didn't like that he said that he was God and they were sinners. And so they picked up rocks, the religious leaders in the temple, and they threw the rocks at Jesus. And Jesus went and found a place to hide for a bit. And then when, I guess they went by that door or something, and then he took off. And what does he do? He goes right outside, and right there, there's a blind man. How appropriate. The light of the earth the light of the world, telling them that he is. They don't want to receive. They don't want the, what he's revealed. They don't want to heal. But he goes out and he finds a guy who who's, who's wants to be healed, a blind man, a man living in darkness. And he heals him. But he got cast out of the temple, and we have temples in this country. The Supreme Court is a hollowed temple. It's been referred to that. But Jesus has been cast out of the Supreme Court. At least, well, not. There were four guys, don't forget, that, that were four people, four justices that voted against the decision and five that voted for it. Let's not forget this. Roe versus Wade. They did the same thing. Religion in school or prayer in school, they did the same thing. The military... Another hollow temple is under siege. The Boy Scouts of America, that's a hollow temple of America. It always has been. I was a scout. I was a scout leader. The scouts that I was a leader in, nothing like today. The president of the Boy Scouts of America, the president of the Boy Scouts of America has said that he believes that homosexual leaders should be allowed. And so, you see, there's this mindset, and we can say whatever we want, and we can say it's wrong, and we can say that, you know, it's the degradation, the, the degeneration, the, the, the decay of society, and it is. But it's not going to make people, the majority of the people now, who, like the Boy Scout leader, or all the young generation, we have a whole generation that doesn't even think that there's anything wrong with same-sex marriage, if you're under 22, well, how do we get through to them when they don't even believe us? When they see us as ir irrelevant, that we're, you know, somehow dinosaurs living in the past? Well, mind you, Jesus didn't come along and restore the blind man's sight. Did you know that? Here in John 9, he didn't restore the sight. Why didn't he restore it? Because the guy never had it. He was born blind. He never had sight. You can't restore something you didn't have. 
He created sight in the man. He took a man blind from birth, and he created eyes that worked. And so it wasn't like this guy was all in sin and messed up and whatnot, and then, you know, he repented and Jesus restored him. This, Jesus came along and did this creative act. A man who dwelled in darkness his entire life as a boy, as a young man, and on into adulthood received sight. And now we have a whole generation, and we have mega churches full of them who have never heard what we know. They haven't heard a sermon on, on fornication, on heterosexual, homosexual. They haven't heard a sermon on same-sex marriage. And all their friends have accepted it. The schools taught them. And so what are we to do? Well, we have to do what God would ask us to do. We know that in Timothy and Titus, what does the Bible say about elders? They're, they're elder. And what about in relationship to marriage? What does it say? Yeah, an elder should, uh, first of all, we know that in the Bible, the men are the elders. And we also know that it says the husband of one wife. Now, that's interpreted in different ways. Some interpret that to mean that you can only have one wife at a time. And so, you know, you can be divorced as long as you're not still married to that first wife. You can have another wife, and, and you're okay. But the bottom line, the very common sense deal is the Bible is saying that if you're to be the elder in church, in a church, you need to be the husband of one wife, not you need to be the husband of a husband. Because that's what is going on out there. You know, I watched um, NCIS one, one episode, and, and Gibbs is telling these two military guys who are married to get married, a uh, homosexual couple, same-sex marriage, and, and he's tell, one guy gets killed, and he tells the other guy, well, I'm sorry about your husband. And, you know, he didn't say sorry about your wife. You don't have two gals living together, m married, and, and they say, oh, well, my husband, here's my husband. Do you? No, they say, here's my wife. And so what do we do? Do we go and do we take Timothy and we correct it? And we say, oh, an elder has to be married to one person and change God's word? How do we do that? In all these different places in the word, we're over and over again. It's in Peter. It talks about the marriage relationship. It talks about the, the wife and the husband and the unequally yoked. Well, it doesn't say, you know, woman, if your husband's an unbeliever, I mean, it does. It says if your husband's an unbeliever, if you're un, uh, unequally yoked, well, just pour that Holy Spirit onto him, and by your witness, he'll, he'll be won over. That's what it says. It doesn't say, woman, if your wife is on the, if you're unequal, unequally yoked with your wife, so what do we do with this? Do we change all these things? Well, of course not. Now, hopefully we can take our president at his word, politician, but you never know, because he has said that the rights of those that believe differently will be protected. And of course, now we're going to court to make sure that's so. And I think that's a good thing, us going to court to make sure it's so that we don't end up being, you know, oh, you can't be a nonprofit because you're, you're against the law of the land. The law of the land says that you have to marry uh, homosexual couples, but we're not, but you're not, you're refusing to do that, and so we're taking away your tax status, and you can't give people contribution slips anymore for their money. Well, we need to be protected so that stuff doesn't happen, amen? Not that it's on there, but it's, it, this could, down the road lead to something like that. And so we need to protect ourselves and be diligent and do our homework and take care of business and preach what we preach. You see, in this church, as in 
most Calvary chapels, we have what's called bylaws. They're corporate bylaws that we had to give to the state of California in order to become a corporation and a nonprofit corporation. And so these bylaws are like, you know, they're, they're, they're a strong, I don't know, how many of you are familiar with bylaws? Okay, some. Well, bylaws are very, very, it's like the cornerstone of, of a corporation. Well, in our bylaws, it states that we define marriage as between a man and a woman. So are we now supposed to go and say, oh, no, well, our bylaws no longer, well, no, because we have religious freedom. Are we supposed to go out and hate people? Are we supposed to throw rocks at them? No. Are we supposed to stand and say, this is right and this is wrong, and here in the Bible is where it says so? Yes, but, you know, just as I asked the question, how many of you, when you run into a situation where you see a couple a, 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 a boy, a boy a, you know, a young man and a young woman who are living together, how many of you stand up and say something about it? Got two. And the other three. Well, it should be all of us. Because I don't know about you, but I've seen this going on for years. You know, and the statistics tell me that there's more doing it than not. And so we must run into them. So they must be in our families. Amen? How many of you have a couple like that in your family? Okay, well, we had two that raised their hands to say that they stand up, and we had a lot more that said that they have family members in those situations. So there you go. When we see sin, we need to lovingly, sensitively, not, you know, with a hatchet, not with a, a club, not with anger and hatred, but with caring, do our best to stand in the gap and blow the trumpet. And if we do that, the blood's not on our hands. If we don't do that, then the blood's on our hands. And so that's what we need to do. But we always need to have compassion and love when we do it. You know, it's, it's been said that Calvary Chapel pastors are different than others because the Baptists, they tell you, you're going to hell, you're going to burn in hell. If you don't repent, you know, you're just going to have thousands of years of, of the unbelievable pain while you burn in hell. Well, Calvary Chapel pastors say, yeah, you know, you don't believe in Jesus. You're going to go to hell. That's the bottom line. And we do it with some love and sensitivity and grace. Except for Raul Reese. And so I could go on and on on this subject and, you know, the fact we'll, we'll continue on about the healing of the man and it's a whole another deal talking about what's happening, what happened in chapter 9 and the dynamics of how this man was healed and the different ways that we can be healed. You know, sometimes people get healed because we lay hands on them. And so the next thing you know, there's some group of Christians that want to go out and start the the laying on of hands ministry for healing. And sometimes we, we say, in the name of Jesus. So then you have a group of Christians, and they go out, and we've got that whole denomination that says, you know, in the name of Jesus only. And then there's oil. Oh, no, you've got to anoint with oil. If you don't anoint with oil, they're not going to get healed. And then there's the mud in the eyes. Now, I haven't heard of a mud in the eye ministry out there. I don't know why, because it certainly is in the Bible. And with all of these things that are taking place in our society, sometimes what Jesus has to do, or not has to, because he doesn't have to do anything, but sometimes what Jesus does is he takes the mud, he takes the, the, the dirt, the, the sand, the dust, the dirt, and he spits in it, he makes a nice, muddy, gritty deal, and he puts it in our eyes. And then when he does that, Jesus, you know, I, I had 10-10 vision, not 20-20, but now I've got zero, and also my eyes are just totally messed up from the sand, and 
and the grit. And how do I, well, go to the, go to the pool of Siloam and wash it out. Go to the place of Jesus. Siloam means send. Go there and get it cleaned out. And sometimes a church, the church, needs to get mud in the eyes so that we can better see. We need to have that irritation to see how things are and where things are going so that we're the people that stand up and say something. Not just picking the sin of the moment, but being an equal opportunity mud in the eye group of people. And of course, Jesus said that's for the church, for the church members, more so than going out there and picking it on the world all the time. And, and you know what? You want to see where you're blind? Well, maybe you can't look in the mirror because you can't see, but you're blind. There's not one of us here who doesn't have blindness, doesn't have darkness. We can easily see other people's darkness, but we each have it. And so we want to start off with ourselves, as, as the Lord said, you know, look at yourselves and look at the church and, and deal with it. And then the sky's not falling down. It's not the end of the earth. It's a setback. It's something horrible. It's an abomination, as far as the Bible calls it, an abomination. And so has society for the Carthaginians, the Aztecs, the the Romans, the, you know, just all throughout society, it's been a man and a woman. And now, in 15 years, that's turned around. And one, so, someone said, how prideful is that, that we can think we can do that? What kind of a people are we that we think we can take that and turn it around? Well, of course, now there's those who are filing the motions, going to court to stop it. And so we'll see what happens. We don't know. And let's pray. Lord God, we pray for these issues, Lord. These social issues are very difficult. And Father God, Gary Johnson, Ken Johnson's son, was, was witnessing on the Internet and about this issue, and, and someone wrote back to him and said, well, don't, do you know someone? Do you have a family member? Or do you have friends? And do you tell them they're going to hell? And, and he said, well, no, I, I, I don't do it that way. I tell them, but I tell them in love. I always love. And even that person that was really calling him out on his statement about the ruling, that person calmed down and said, oh, okay, well, that's, that's really good. I'm, I'm glad that's how you do it. And when we do it right, we get deeper into a person than when we try to force them. You can't force people or we try to slam them or stump them to death or whatever, Lord. Taliban does that and doesn't get them far. And so, Lord, let us be a people who love, but let us be a people who love the word enough and love the truth enough that we never want to get to a place where you can't find it in our country. Like in Amos, truth was nowhere to be found. The word was nowhere to be found. We don't want to cast you out of this great nation, this great temple called America, Lord. But it's up to us to be the ones, to be the example, Lord, first and foremost. And it starts with our, our own community, Lord. And it's not easy. And I pray for each and every person here, because I know there's people here, Lord, who, who have family members, who have friends, who have co-workers in these situations. It's just impossible for that not to be. And Lord, I just pray that you'd give them that perfect balance, Lord, and help them to, to deal with the situations that will come up, Lord, from day to day. And Lord, that we would be a bold people, though. And we'd, I always like to tell them the Bible says this, not me, but the Bible says this. Pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. It's not easy, people.